In the heart of a dense, fog-laden forest stood the remnants of an old, abandoned manor, its history shrouded in tragedy and whispered tales of horror. Locals avoided the path leading to its decrepit gates, and the air around it seemed to throng with the echoes of its dark past. The house had been the site of a gruesome family massacre decades ago, where every member was found lifeless, their expressions twisted in terror, but no perpetrator was ever identified. One evening, a group of thrill-seeking teenagers, drawn by the allure of the manor's macabre history, decided to explore it. As they pushed through the creaking front doors, the house groaned as if awakening from a deep slumber. Ignoring the chilling ambience and the warning signs of danger, they ventured deeper into the mansion's decaying embrace. They found themselves in a grand, dust-choked hall adorned with faded portraits whose eyes seemed to follow their every move. The air was thick with silence, save for the occasional floorboard groan beneath their feet. As they delved further, they stumbled upon a locked door in the basement, its surface cold and unwelcoming. Overcome by curiosity and the bravado of youth, they managed to force the door open. Beyond lay a dimly lit room filled with old, leather-bound journals, their pages yellowed with age. The writings revealed the tortured mind of the manor's last owner, who spoke of being haunted by visions of his deceased family members, pleading and accusing him simultaneously. As night deepened, strange occurrences began to unfold. Objects moved inexplicably, chilling whispers filled the air, and the temperature dropped to a bone-chilling cold. The group, now gripped by fear, realized too late that the manor was not as abandoned as they had believed. Their exploration turned into a nightmare as they encountered spectral figures, whose appearances mirrored the portraits in the hall. The spirits, angry and vengeful, seemed to be reenacting the night of the massacre, leading the teenagers through a macabre dance of death and madness. In their frantic escape, one of them stumbled upon a hidden room containing a horrifying scene, a tableau of mannequins arranged in a grotesque imitation of a family dinner, with one seat eerily empty, as if waiting for someone to join the eternal gathering. The realization dawned on them that the manor was reliving its tragic past, and they were now part of its sinister narrative. As they raced to escape, the boundary between the living and the dead blurred, trapping them in a cycle of horror that mirrored the manor's own perpetual torment. The story abruptly ends as they reach the manor's threshold, the outside world seemingly within reach, but an overwhelming sense of dread suggests that escaping the mansion's grasp might not be as simple as stepping through its doors. As the teenagers neared the threshold of the manor, a thunderous clamor erupted behind them, the house shuddering as if in the throes of an enraged beast. The door, once seemingly an escape route, now appeared as a mocking portal to a maze of terror they couldn't flee. Each step they took towards freedom paradoxically dragged them deeper into the manor's clutches, the architecture morphing unnaturally, hallways elongating and rooms shifting in a disorienting dance. They found themselves separated, isolated in different parts of the manor, their screams for each other swallowed by the oppressive silence. One of the teenagers, Alex, stumbled into a library filled with ancient tomes, where whispered voices beckoned him to uncover hidden truths. The books seemed alive, their pages fluttering to passages detailing rituals and dark pacts that hinted at the manor's malevolent sentience. Meanwhile, Emily, another member of the group, wandered into a grand ballroom, its decayed opulence bathed in an eerie, spectral light. Ghostly figures danced in an endless waltz, their hollow eyes fixed on her, inviting her to join their never-ending revelry. As she backed away, the music grew frenzied, and the dancers' movements became more desperate, mirroring the tragedy that had befallen the manor's original inhabitants. In a distant wing, Michael found himself in what appeared to be a child's nursery. Toys of a bygone era lay scattered, and a rocking horse moved gently of its own accord. A chilling giggle echoed, and shadowy figures darted in the periphery of his vision, playing hide-and-seek with an unseen spectre. The room felt alive with the memories of the children who once played there, their joy overshadowed by the darkness of their untimely deaths. Back in the main hall, Sarah, the last of the group, noticed the portrait's eyes now wept tears of blood, their expressions contorted in agony. 
The manor's history unfolded before her in violent flashes, a lineage cursed by greed and betrayal, a legacy of death that tainted its very foundations. The separate experiences of the teenagers began to weave together, revealing the manor's true horror. It was a sentient entity, fed by the tragedies of its past inhabitants and energized by the fear of those who dared to trespass its cursed halls. The manor was not just a setting for the massacre, it was its architect, manipulating its residents and visitors alike to recreate its dark history. As the night waned, the boundaries between past and present dissolved, and the teenagers found themselves participants in the manor's history, each playing a role in the reenactment of its tragic past. The realization struck them with chilling clarity, they were not just in a haunted house, they were part of its haunting, integral to the story it perpetually relived. In a desperate bid to break the cycle, they sought to reunite and uncover the heart of the manor's curse, hoping to find a way to sever the ties that bound them to its fate. Their journey through the shifting, treacherous corridors of the manor became a race against time, as dawn's first light promised either salvation or doom, the nature of which remained uncertain in the manor's twisted reality. In the dim light of the encroaching dawn, the teenagers' efforts to reconvene became a harrowing odyssey through the manor's morphing halls. Each corridor seemed to stretch into infinity, each room a puzzle box of eerie, cryptic clues about the manor's sordid past and its spectral inhabitants. Alex, in the library, deciphered a passage in an ancient grimoire revealing the origin of the manor's curse, a pact made with a malevolent entity seeking perpetual torment for those within its walls. The text suggested that the curse could be broken by reenacting the ritual that birthed it, Yet the critical components of the ceremony were maddeningly vague, hidden in riddles and arcane symbols that seemed to shift and change even as he studied them. Meanwhile, Emily, trapped in the ballroom, discovered a grand piano playing itself, the music not just a melody but a sonic key to the manor's memory. Each note resonated with the structure, causing it to momentarily reveal pathways and hidden rooms, offering her glimpses of the manor's dark heart. She realized the music was a map, guiding her through the manor's labyrinthine interior toward a central chamber pulsing with a dark energy. Michael, in the nursery, encountered the spirits of the children, who were not malevolent but trapped souls yearning for release. They communicated through childish drawings, showing him the history of the manor through innocent yet hauntingly distorted imagery. These drawings highlighted a specific area of the manor's grounds, an old, gnarled tree that seemed to be a nexus of spectral activity, its roots possibly entwined with the source of the curse. Sarah, navigating the main hall, discovered a series of mechanical contraptions and optical illusions that, when aligned correctly, projected a holographic blueprint of the manor. This blueprint revealed a hidden underground chamber directly beneath the gnarled tree Michael was drawn to, suggesting a physical and spiritual connection central to the manor's haunting. As they pieced together the clues, a coherent picture began to form. The manor itself was a carefully designed trap, a puzzle box made to ensnare the living and the dead alike. The ritual to break the curse required them to be at specific locations within the house, performing tasks that mirrored the original events leading to the curse's creation. Determined to end the nightmare, the teenagers set out to align themselves with the manor's dark past, each taking their place in the ritual's recreation. As they prepared to enact their parts, the manor seemed to anticipate their intentions, its ambience turning increasingly hostile. Walls bled shadows, statues wept blood, and the air thronged with a palpable dread. Just as they began the ritual, the entity bound to the manor manifested, a formless darkness coalescing into a figure both terrifying and pitiful, a twisted soul condemned to relive its agony. This entity, the source of the curse, confronted them, its presence a suffocating miasma of despair and rage. As they stood on the brink of either lifting the curse or succumbing to the manor's dark history, the line between the living and the spectral blurred, casting them into a realm where time folded upon itself, and the past's horrors bled into the present, setting the stage for a confrontation with the very heart of the manor's darkness. In this shadowed realm where past and present intertwined, the teenagers faced the entity, its form a swirling mass of anguish and malice. 
The manor, alive with the entity's power, contorted around them, its architecture an ever-changing maze of horror. The air was thick with whispers of the dead, recounting the entity's tragic origin, a tale of betrayal, murder, and a curse born from vengeful fury. Alex, armed with knowledge from the ancient grimoire, directed the others in the ritual, each step mirrored against the entity's untortured history. They needed to retrace the events leading to the curse, to offer the entity a semblance of the peace it never had. As they proceeded, the manor spectral inhabitants, bound to the entity's fate, materialized not as foes but as guides, their actions hinting at the ritual's correct path. Emily, at the piano in the ballroom, played the haunting melody that echoed the entity's sorrow, the notes cutting through the dense malaise, guiding her friends through the manor's shifting geography. The music became a beacon, its melody a thread leading through the darkness, helping the group navigate towards the underground chamber beneath the gnarled tree. Michael, with the ghostly children, discovered that their innocent play was the key to unlocking the manor's time-warped secrets. Each game revealed patterns that mirrored the ritual steps, guiding him to reunite with the others, his path lit by the ephemeral glow of childlike spirits. Sarah, deciphering the holographic blueprint, found mechanisms hidden within the manor's walls that, when activated, opened secret passageways and revealed the true extent of the underground chamber. Her journey unveiled the manor's heart, a nexus where all its pain and darkness converged. As they converged at the gnarled tree, the underground chamber revealed itself, a vast space where the roots of the tree penetrated the darkness, pulsing with the curse's life force. The entity, now manifesting more clearly, revealed its true form, a tormented soul, trapped in a cycle of its own making, its appearance a grotesque mirror of its inner turmoil. The teenagers, realizing the entity was not just the source but also a victim of the curse, shifted their strategy from confrontation to liberation. They worked to complete the ritual, not to banish the entity, but to free it from its eternal torment, believing this would break the cycle and release the manor from its haunted state. As they each took their positions in the chamber, performing tasks that symbolically mirrored the manor's tragic events, the air shimmered with ethereal light, the roots of the tree glowing with otherworldly energy. The manor trembled, not in malice, but as if in anticipation of release from its long suffering. The ritual neared its climax, with the teenagers and the entity locked in a dance of fate, each action unraveling the tangled threads of the curse. The boundary between the material and the spectral grew ever thinner, the manor's history replaying around them in vivid, spectral reenactments. In this charged atmosphere, where every heartbeat echoed the manor's pain, the teenagers continued the ritual, their actions becoming part of the manor's story, weaving new outcomes into its tapestry of tragedy. As the narrative of the past was rewritten, the future of both the living and the dead hung in the balance, the outcome poised to either end the curse or bind them all to the manor forever. In the depths of the underground chamber, as the ritual progressed, the air vibrated with the power of unspoken words and suppressed cries. The manor's walls, now translucent, pulsed with the light of a hundred souls, their faces pressed against the surface, eyes filled with hope and despair. The entity, its form stabilizing, became a poignant figure of tragedy, its features reflecting every soul it had consumed in its agony. It hovered over the ritual, its essence intertwined with the gnarled tree's roots, which writhed like serpents, seeking solace or perhaps redemption. Alex, his voice steady, recited incantations from the grimoire, his words cutting through the supernatural fog, each syllable a beacon for the trapped souls. The ancient text revealed its final secret, the ritual was not just to free the entity but also to restore balance, to offer forgiveness where there was none and to heal wounds that time had forgotten. Emily's music, now a symphony of sorrow and hope, resonated through the chamber, intertwining with Alex's incantations, creating a harmony that seemed to suit the entity's tortured spirit. The melodies weaved through the roots, illuminating them with a soft, golden light, unraveling the darkness that had been woven into the manor's very foundation. Michael, surrounded by the ghostly children, led them in a procession, 
their innocent laughter and joyful play infusing the chamber with a purity long lost. The children, in their spectral form, touched the roots, their presence acting as a bond to the entity's pain, their laughter a counterpoint to the centuries of screams and lamentations. Sarah, manipulating the holographic blueprint, found levers and switches hidden within the chamber, each activation syncing with the ritual's rhythm, revealing hidden alcoves where the personal effects of the manor's past inhabitants were stored. These relics, imbued with their owner's life force, began to glow, casting light upon the entity's shadow, revealing the human behind the horror. As the ritual reached its zenith, the chamber throbbed with a life force of its own, the tree's roots now glowing with ethereal energy, pulsating in rhythm with the hearts of those present. The entity, caught in the ritual's embrace, began to shed its malice, layer by layer, revealing the tormented soul beneath. The teenagers, now contents of the ritual's power, felt the weight of centuries lift, as if the manor itself was exhaling, releasing its pent-up anguish. The spirits of the manor, from the spectral dancers in the ballroom to the playful children in the nursery, converged on the chamber, their forms shimmering with light, drawn to the ritual-like moths to a flame. As these spirits entered the chamber, they melded with the entity, their combined energies sparking a transformation. The entity's form, once a maelstrom of darkness, began to fragment, its outline dissolving into a cascade of luminous particles, each spark a release of its bound souls, freed from the cycle of torment. The chamber, now a crucible of rebirth and release, echoed with the combined voices of the living and the dead, a chorus of liberation that resonated through the manor's very foundation. The walls of the manor, once oppressive barriers, now shimmered with transparency, revealing the breaking dawn outside, its light a promise of a new beginning. As the entity's form dissipated, the curse that held the manor in its grip for centuries began to unravel, the oppressive atmosphere lifting, replaced by a serene calm. The teenagers, exhausted yet exhilarated, stood at the heart of the chamber, witnessing the culmination of their journey, not just as spectators, but as key players in the manor's history. The ritual's completion neared, with the manor's fate and that of its spectral inhabitants hanging in the balance, the dawn's light creeping into the chamber signifying the closing of an age-long chapter and the beginning of something new, yet the final act of this spectral drama remained unwritten, poised on the cusp of revelation. As the dawn's light filtered into the chamber, casting long shadows and illuminating the faces of the teenagers with a soft, golden glow, the atmosphere inside the manor shifted. The oppressive dread that had saturated the air was dissipating, replaced by a sense of tranquility and closure. The manor, recognizing the sacrifice and courage of the teenagers, seemed to be shedding its haunted legacy, layer by layer. The entity, now a mere whisper of its former self, hovered at the edge of existence, its form flickering like a candle in the wind. Its eyes, clear for the first time in centuries, locked onto the teenagers, conveying a silent gratitude and sorrow, acknowledging its tumultuous past and the peace it was finally being granted. The roots of the gnarled tree, once conduits of the curse, now shimmered with a radiant energy, intertwining with the spectral figures, guiding them towards the afterlife. Each spirit, embracing this transformation, passed through the teenagers, leaving behind a trail of luminescent echoes, memories of their lives and deaths, imparting wisdom and warnings, blessings, and farewells. Alex, feeling the grimoire's power wane, realized the book was not just a tool for the ritual but a repository of the manor's consciousness, its pages a living testament to the history it had witnessed. As the ritual concluded, the grimoire's pages turned blank, its purpose fulfilled, its legacy transferred to those who had braved its secrets. Emily's piano, silent now, stood as a monument to the night's ordeal, its keys glistening with the residual energy of the played melody, a haunting tune that would resonate in the memories of those who heard it, a lullaby of redemption and release. Michael, surrounded by the dissipating forms of the ghostly children, felt a poignant loss, as if he was parting from long-lost friends. Their laughter, now a distant echo, left a promise in the air, a reminder of the innocence and joy that once pervaded the manor before it became a mausoleum of despair. Sarah, watching the holographic blueprint fade, 
understood that the manor's secrets were not meant to be contained or controlled, but understood and respected. The blueprint, like the grimoire, vanished, signifying the end of the manor's curse and the beginning of its new legacy as a place of peace and remembrance. As the sun rose, casting its light over the manor, the building itself seemed to sigh with relief, its walls no longer prison bars but the protective boundaries of a sanctified place. The manor, liberated from its centuries-old torment, stood as a beacon of hope and a testament to the power of understanding and confronting the past. The teenagers, their roles as inadvertent saviors completed, found themselves at a crossroads, forever changed by the night's events. The manor's grounds, once a labyrinth of fear and mystery, now welcomed them as heroes of a silent battle, fought not with weapons but with bravery, empathy, and a desire to right the wrongs of history. As they prepared to leave the manor, the sun fully revealing the path home, they felt the weight of their experience, a mix of triumph and melancholy. The manor, a silent sentinel behind them, stood not as a haunted house but as a house that had been haunted, its spirits now at rest, its secrets unveiled. The teenagers, stepping into the light of the new day, carried with them the legacy of the manor, a reminder that sometimes, the most frightening horrors are not those that lurk in the shadows, but those that dwell in the hearts of men, waiting to be faced, understood, and ultimately, forgiven. As the teenagers walked away from the manor, the early morning mist began to lift, revealing the true magnificence of the estate, its beauty long obscured by the veil of terror that had enshrouded it. The manor, now serene and almost welcoming, stood as a monument to their harrowing journey, its walls whispering tales of redemption and renewal. But as they reached the edge of the property, a subtle shift occurred. The air shimmered, hinting at unseen forces still at play. The ground beneath their feet trembled lightly, a gentle reminder that while the immediate curse was lifted, the manor's story was far from over. The entity, though pacified, had been a guardian of secrets darker and deeper than any of them could fathom. Behind them, the manor seemed to watch, its windows like eyes, reflecting the breaking dawn yet hinting at depths unexplored. In the light, shadows moved, suggesting that not all spirits had been freed, some, perhaps, chose to stay, bound by love, duty, or unfinished business. Alex, clutching the now blank grimoire, felt a residual pulse emanating from its pages, as if the book still harbored a final message or a key to further mysteries. The ancient tome, its role in the night's events undeniable, seemed to be waiting for the right moment to reveal its last secrets. Emily, haunted by the melodies she played, sensed an unfinished symphony, notes hanging in the air, on some verses of the manor's history that beckoned her to delve deeper into its musical legacy. The piano's silent keys were a reminder that some tunes were yet to be played, their harmonies capable of unlocking yet more of the manor's enigmas. Michael, feeling the loss of the childlike spirits, realized that their playful guidance had been more than mere assistance, it was an invitation to uncover the layers of innocence and tragedy that the manor had witnessed, stories of lives cut short and dreams unfulfilled. Sarah, pondering the vanishing blueprint, understood that the manor was not just a structure but a living archive of every soul that had passed through its doors. The fading lines of the hologram hinted at narratives yet to be discovered, parts within the manor that led to hidden truths and buried tales waiting to be told. As they paused, contemplating the journey back to their normal lives, a mutual realization dawned upon them, their adventure within the manor had changed them, imbuing them with a sense of purpose and a hunger for truth. The legacy of the manor was now intertwined with their own destinies, a chapter in their lives that was far from concluded. Compelled by an unspoken agreement, they turned back to face the manor, understanding that their night of horror was merely the prologue to a much larger story. The manor, with its newly awakened presence, seemed to beckon them, inviting them to unravel the tapestry of its past and to explore the depths of its haunted heart. With a mixture of trepidation and resolve, they approached the manor once more, stepping into the embrace of its shadowed halls, their footsteps echoing in the silence. The journey ahead promised to reveal the secrets of the manor's ancient legacy, its walls ready to divulge tales of sorrow, joy, betrayal, and love, 
each room a chapter, each corridor a narrative thread leading to the heart of the manor's untold history. Stepping back into the manor, the air around them thickened, charged with the unspoken words of the past. The once menacing silence was now filled with the soft whisper of the house, inviting them to delve deeper into its enigmatic heart. The manor, reborn through the night's ritual, held layers of history yet to be peeled back, each room a vault of secrets, every artifact a silent witness to the estate's storied past. The teenagers, now the manor's chosen, felt the weight of their newfound responsibility. The manor, in its silent, stately manner, seemed to acknowledge their return, doors opening as if in welcome, the previously hostile shadows now playing at their feet, guiding them onward. As they traversed the grand hall, they noticed changes subtle yet profound. Portraits on the walls, once grim and sorrowful, now bore expressions of serene acceptance, their eyes following the group not with malice but with an almost parental concern. The blood tears were gone, replaced by a soft glow that emanated from each frame, illuminating the path forward. Alex, drawn to a hidden alcove revealed by the shifting walls, found a series of letters and diaries dating back centuries, their pages filled with the personal accounts of the manor's former inhabitants. These writings spoke of love, loss, and betrayal, but also of redemption and hope, offering clues to the deeper, more complex narrative of the manor and its legacy. Emily, led by an unseen force, discovered a secluded chamber housing an ancient organ. Its keys, unlike the pianos, beckoned her to play, producing sounds that vibrated with the essence of the house, unlocking memories trapped in the very stone and wood, revealing hidden passageways and secret rooms that whispered of lost treasures and forgotten tragedies. Michael, following the faint laughter of the spectral children, was guided to the manor's old nursery. There, amidst the remnants of play and innocence, he found a series of intricate murals depicting the manor's history from its inception, each painting alive with scenes that moved and changed, showing the estate through the eyes of its youngest occupants. Sarah, her curiosity piqued by the architectural anomalies of the house, explored the structural heart of the manor, discovering an ancient foundation stone in the cellar. Engraved with cryptic symbols and languages long forgotten, the stone pulsed with a gentle power, suggesting it was the key to the manor's birth and possibly its ultimate salvation. As they each explored their discoveries, they realized that the manor was not just a place of haunting and horror but also a repository of wisdom and history, a custodian of stories that transcended time and death. The manor, through its trials and tribulations, had become a living chronicle of the human condition, capturing the essence of both the darkness and light found within the soul. The deeper they delved into the manor's secrets, the more they understood the entity's initial wrath and subsequent liberation. It was a reflection of the manor's own journey from a place of suffering and fear to one of understanding and peace. But the path to fully unlocking the manor's mysteries was fraught with challenges, as shadows of the past lingered, protective of their secrets and wary of the living. As the day waned, the manor seemed to settle around them, its many voices the creak of wood, the sigh of the wind, the murmur of the walls converging into a silent yet eloquent narrative. The teenagers, standing in the heart of the grand hall, felt a profound connection to the manor, their fates intertwined with its own, their story a new layer in its ancient tapestry. Ready to embrace the journey ahead, they prepared to explore the unseen depths of the manor, to confront the remnants of its dark past, and to unearth the truths buried within its walls. The manor, once a prison of horrors, now offered itself as a crucible of revelation, promising to reveal the secrets of a bygone era and the legacy of those who walked its halls, a story unfolding with each step they took into the unknown. As the evening shadows lengthened, casting the manor in a twilight embrace, the teenager's exploration took on a new urgency. The house, alive with the whispers of its past inhabitants, seemed eager to divulge its hidden lore, each room and corridor leading them deeper into the heart of its history. In the library, Alex uncovered a secret compartment within the fireplace mantle, revealing a collection of ancient artifacts, amulets, talismans, and other esoteric items, each linked to the manor's legacy and its battles with forces both terrestrial and supernatural. 
These objects resonated with a power that suggested they were not merely ceremonial, but had been integral to the rituals and protections of the estate. Emily, drawn by an inexplicable melody, found herself in a conservatory where a grand harp stood, its strings shimmering in the fading light. As she plucked the strings, the sound resonated through the manor, unlocking further secrets. Visions of the past, happy and horrific, played out in the room, showing the manor in different eras, revealing the joys and tragedies that had unfolded within its walls. Michael, following the playful spirits of the children, discovered a series of hidden passages that led to a sunken garden, overgrown yet beautiful. In its center lay a statue of an angel, weeping into a fountain whose waters flowed with a luminous quality. The garden, seemingly forgotten by time, held the memories of the manor's former glory and the key to understanding the cyclical nature of its history. Sarah, delving into the architectural heart of the manor, found blueprints that detailed not just the physical structure but also metaphysical designs, suggesting that the manor was built not just as a home but as a sanctuary against unseen dark forces. The plans indicated a network of ley lines and energy vortices converging beneath the manor, hinting at the source of its power and its curse. As night fell, the manor seemed to come alive with a different energy, more inviting yet no less mysterious. The air thronged with the power of untold stories, and the walls echoed with the laughter and cries of generations. The teenagers, now deeply entwined with the manor's fate, felt a shift in their perception, as if the house itself was revealing its true nature to them, not as intruders but as inheritors of its legacy. Exploring further, they encountered rooms that defied the laws of time and space, containing objects that flickered between eras, phasing in and out of reality. Portraits on the walls changed, depicting the manor's inhabitants in various epochs, each painting a clue to the puzzles that lay within the fabric of the house. The night deepened, and the manor's interior grew more labyrinthine, its corridors and staircases leading to impossible geometries and doors that opened onto distant lands and times. The teenagers realized that the manor was not just a repository of history but a nexus of timelines, a meeting point for different realities, each connected to the manor's heart. As they navigated this complex tapestry of time and space, the manor presented them with challenges and puzzles, each solution bringing them closer to understanding the true extent of its power and the origins of its haunting. The spirits of the house, once tormented and restless, now aided their journey, offering guidance and protection as they delved into the deeper, more arcane mysteries of the estate. With each step, they uncovered more about the manor's role in the cosmic balance, its walls a barrier against chaos and darkness, its foundation a bastion of light and knowledge. The teenagers, in their quest, were not just uncovering the past but becoming part of the manor's ongoing story, their actions echoing in its halls, shaping its future. The journey through the manor became a journey through history itself, each room a chapter, each artifact a key to understanding the broader narrative of the world's hidden lore. The manor, with its twisting corridors and endless mysteries, beckoned them deeper, promising answers and wonders, its secrets unfolding like a dark flower in the moonlight, revealing the heart of its eternal mystery. As dawn broke on the horizon, casting a pale light through the manor's expansive windows, the teenagers gathered in the main hall, their night of exploration revealing the true essence of the estate. The manor, once a nexus of terror and despair, had transformed into a beacon of understanding and reconciliation. They stood together, united by their journey through the labyrinthine corridors of history and mystery, their eyes reflecting the wisdom and burdens of their newfound knowledge. The entity, now a benign presence, materialized before them, its form no longer menacing but serene, a guardian spirit of the manor. In a voice that resonated with the sorrow and joy of centuries, it spoke of the manor's role as a keeper of balance between the mortal realm and the ethereal, its foundation steeped in the duty to guard against the darkness that lurked beyond the veil of reality. The teenagers, through their trials, had not only unraveled the manor's haunted past but had also fortified its barriers against the encroaching shadows, renewing its strength as a sentinel against chaos. 
the entity, expressing gratitude, bestowed upon them blessings of protection and wisdom, acknowledging that their fates were forever intertwined with the manor's legacy. As the entity faded into the morning light, the manor settled into a peaceful silence, its halls and rooms basking in the glow of redemption. The teenagers, their mission complete, felt a profound connection to the house, no longer as intruders but as custodians of its secrets and defenders of its purpose. With the first rays of sunlight piercing through the darkness, the manor's appearance transformed. The once foreboding structure now stood majestic and inviting, its architecture a testament to the enduring strength of light over darkness. The spirits of the manor, freed from their eternal torment, appeared one last time, not as haunting spectres but as grateful souls, passing into the afterlife with smiles of relief and peace. The teenagers stepped outside, the manor's grounds vibrant with life, the air filled with the scent of blooming flowers and the chorus of the morning birds. The haunting melodies and whispers of the night had given way to a harmonious symphony of nature and tranquility. As they walked away, the manor behind them stood not as a place of horror but as a symbol of courage, understanding, and the eternal battle between darkness and light. They realized that their adventure was more than a ghostly encounter, it was a journey of self-discovery, a test of bravery, and a lesson in the power of empathy and resolve. The sun climbed higher, casting away the last shadows of the night, and the teenagers, changed forever by their experience, knew that the manor would always be a part of them, a chapter in their lives where they faced the unknown and emerged victorious. They walked into the daylight, not as mere survivors of a haunted night but as enlightened guardians of a deep and powerful truth, ready to face the world with new eyes, where every shadow held a story, and every light a lesson. And so, the manor stood in silent vigil, its legacy of horror replaced by a legacy of heroism and hope, a beacon for those who dare to confront the darkness and uncover the light within. The story of the manor and the brave souls who uncovered its truths would be whispered through the ages, a tale of terror turned triumph, a testament to the enduring power of the human spirit. With the first light of dawn casting a golden hue over the forest, Tom and Sarah stood among the ruins, the weight of their newfound responsibility pressing upon them. The land, now quiet and watchful, seemed to acknowledge their role as the new guardians, the legacy of the stone circle and the cabin passed onto their hands. They decided to explore the area one last time before leaving, searching for anything that might further explain their roles and the tasks that lay ahead. As they sifted through the remnants of the cabin, they uncovered a hidden compartment beneath the cellar floor, containing a set of ancient tomes bound in leather, their pages filled with arcane knowledge and the history of the guardianship. The books detailed the rituals and ceremonies performed by the guardians, the significance of the stone circle, and the importance of the alignment of celestial bodies in strengthening the barrier between worlds. It became clear that the ritual at the stone circle was not just a defensive measure, but a critical part of a cycle that maintained the balance of natural and supernatural forces. Intrigued and overwhelmed by the depth of their discovery, they realized that the knowledge they gained that night was just the beginning. The books mentioned other locations, similar to the gas station and the cabin, where the veil between worlds was thin and guardians were needed to maintain the balance. As they prepared to leave, the forest seemed to whisper a farewell, the trees rustling with a sound like murmured blessings. The locket, now securely around Sarah's neck, felt warm against her skin, a constant reminder of the lineage she had stepped into, the history and mystery it represented. Driving away from the gas station, the couple reflected on their harrowing night and the journey ahead. The world seemed different now, fuller and darker, filled with hidden truths waiting to be discovered and ancient forces requiring vigilance. Their first stop was to be the town library, to research the locations mentioned in the tomes and to uncover more about the celestial events that would dictate their next move. They knew they needed to prepare, to study the rituals and understand the legacy of the guardianship fully. The road ahead was long and uncertain, 
But Tom and Sarah were determined to fulfill their roles, protect the balance, and uncover the mysteries of the guardianship. They were part of a story much larger than themselves, a narrative woven through time and space, involving forces beyond the comprehension of ordinary lives. As they drove towards the rising sun, the gas station faded into the background, its secrets now their secrets, its legacy their responsibility. The story of the last stop gas and go was far from over, it had merely found its new guardians, ready to face whatever darkness lay ahead in the unfolding saga of the thin veil that separated their world from the ones lurking in the shadows. Continue from the previous story and make it longer like the plot of a horror script in a film and don't make an ending or conclusion. So that this story can be continued in the next process. As Tom and Sarah embarked on their global quest to locate the other stone circles and possibly connect with remaining guardians, they encountered a world where the lines between myth and reality were irrevocably blurred. Each location held its own secrets, guarded by challenges both physical and metaphysical, testing their resolve and deepening their understanding of the ancient guardianship. In a remote part of Scotland, they found a circle ensconced in mist, the stones weathered by time, their surfaces etched with runes that hummed with an unseen energy. Local legend spoke of the circle as a gateway to the other world, a place of spirits and fey folk. As they conducted the rituals described in the tomes, the air shimmered, revealing glimpses of that ethereal realm, and whispering voices filled their minds with knowledge long forgotten. Their journey then led them to a hidden valley in the Himalayas, where a circle lay protected by monastic guardians, monks who had kept the secrets of the stones for centuries. These guardians shared ancient manuscripts with Tom and Sarah, revealing deeper layers of the cosmic struggle and the celestial mechanics behind the alignments. Here, they practiced rites of protection and sealing, their powers growing under the tutelage of the monks. In the dense jungles of Central America, they uncovered a circle overgrown with vines and roots, the stones almost consumed by the earth. The local tribes, descendants of the original guardians, held oral histories that completed the fragmented tales within the tomes. With their guidance, Tom and Sarah learned to harness the raw energies of the land, binding them to the stones to strengthen the barriers between worlds. Each circle brought new revelations, unveiling the complexity of the guardianship and the enormity of the task ahead. They learned that the stone circles were not merely markers or tools, but living entities, each with a consciousness shaped by the land and its history, each requiring a unique approach to awaken and align its energies for the upcoming celestial event. As the date of the alignment drew near, Tom and Sarah felt the pressure of their mission mounting. The world's energy grew restless, the veil thinning, as if anticipating the cosmic dance of the planets. Reports of strange occurrences, sightings of inexplicable creatures, and tales of shadows haunting the edges of reality became more frequent, a sign that the barriers were weakening. Returning to the gas station stone circle, now fully aware of their role in the grand tapestry of guardianship, they prepared for the ritual that would align and strengthen the global network of circles. They arranged the artifacts they had gathered from each side, forming a pattern that resonated with the ley lines and celestial energies. As the celestial event began, the sky darkened unnaturally, stars aligning in a pattern that mirrored the runes on the stones. Tom and Sarah started the ritual, their voices joining in an ancient chant, the artifacts glowing with power. The energy within the circle spiraled upwards, forming a column of light that pierced the heavens, signaling to the other guardians across the world to begin their own rites. The air crackled with power, the boundary between worlds pulsating like a heartbeat, faster and stronger. The fabric of reality stretched thin, shadows moving at the edge of sight, whispering promises and threats in the chaos of the moment. In this climax of celestial and terrestrial forces, Tom and Sarah stood firm, their focus unyielding, as they wove the energies into a protective shield around the earth, the stone circles and network of beacons warding off the encroaching darkness. The fate of the world hung in balance, the thin veil fluttering like a sail in a storm, ready to tear and reveal the abyss beyond. The Guardian's chant rose to a crescendo, a plea and command to the cosmos, 
To hold the shadows at bay, to seal the doors that should never be opened, their story a battle cry and a hymn, echoing through the fabric of reality, a tale of light holding the darkness at arm's length. Under the darkened sky, pierced by the column of light from the stone circle, Tom and Sarah's voices merged with the ancient chant, creating a resonance that vibrated across the land. The ground beneath them thrummed with energy, as if the earth itself was responding to the call of the guardians, aiding in their defense against the encroaching darkness. Around the world, at the other stone circles, the network of guardians stood in unison, their rituals synchronizing to form a protective lattice around the planet. This global unity of purpose and action created a pulsating shield that shimmered in the night, visible only to those attuned to the supernatural realms. As the celestial bodies aligned, a deep silence fell over the world, a momentary pause that felt like the universe holding its breath. Then, with a suddenness that tore at the senses, the alignment reached its peak, and the energies unleashed a torrent of light and power that surged through the ley lines, connecting the circles in a blazing web of defiance against the darkness. In this instant, Tom and Sarah saw the veil between worlds thin to translucency, revealing the horrors that lurked just beyond, clawing and snarling at the barriers. Monstrous forms, twisted and terrible, pressed against the shimmering shield, their features a nightmare tapestry of all that humanity feared and fled from in the dark. Yet, for every snarl and claw that soared to tear through the veil, there was a counterstroke of light from the guardians, a note in the ancient chant that sealed the breach, a pulse of power from the stones that reinforced the barrier. The battle, though silent and unseen by the mundane world, raged with a ferocity that matched the most tumultuous storms of history. Amidst this cosmic struggle, Tom and Sarah felt a deepening connection to the guardianship, their spirits entwined with the fabric of the ritual, their wills bending but unbroken under the strain. The locket around Sarah's neck glowed with a fierce light, its chain pulsating like a heartbeat, a talisman of strength and a beacon to the lost souls caught in the tumult. The hours passed, each moment an eternity of conflict, until the celestial bodies began to shift, the alignment ebbing. As the cosmic forces waned, so too did the pressure against the veil, the monstrous entities retreating into the shadows, their roars and hisses fading like echoes in a vast chamber. Exhausted but triumphant, the guardians across the globe completed their rituals, the light from the stone circles dimming, the ley lines quieting. A sense of peace, hard-won and fragile, settled over the world, the immediate threat abated but the knowledge of what lay beyond the veil indelibly etched in the minds of those who had stood in defense of the realm. Tom and Sarah, their role in the ritual complete, collapsed beside the stone circle, the locket between them dimming to a soft glow. The sun began to rise, casting the first light of dawn across a world unchanged to the unknowing eye but forever altered to those who had witnessed the night's events. The guardians, scattered across the earth, each felt the dawning of a new day and the closing of a chapter in the ancient chronicle of the guardianship. But the story was far from over. The veil had held, but it had thinned, and the darkness beyond it had tasted the proximity of the world it hungered to consume. As Tom and Sarah stood at the edge of the last stop gas and go, the rising sun at their backs, they knew that their journey had only just begun. The guardianship was a legacy of perpetual vigilance, a mantle passed through the ages, and they were the latest to carry its weight. The road ahead was long, and the shadows they fought would return, perhaps in different forms, perhaps at different times, but the battle between light and darkness was eternal. Their story, woven into the larger tapestry of the guardianship, continued forward, a narrative thread among many, in the ongoing saga of those who stand at the threshold, keeping the darkness at bay, their lives a testament to the light that endures in the face of the night's deepest shadows. As the new day dawned, Tom and Sarah stood before the last stop gas and go, the morning light casting long shadows across the forecourt, turning the ordinary into something spectral. The events of the night lingered in their minds, a surreal contrast to the peaceful sunrise. They realized that the gas station was more than a waypoint on their journey, it was a symbol of their new reality, a nexus between the everyday world and the hidden realms they were sworn to protect. 
Deciding to explore the gas station once more, they found that the place had transformed. The eerie atmosphere had dissipated, replaced by a quiet stillness. Inside, the shop was no longer a dingy, neglected space but seemed to hold a new significance, its every detail a part of the larger mystery. Behind the counter, they discovered a hidden compartment containing a series of journals, old and dusty, penned by the previous guardians. The entries detailed encounters with the supernatural, strategies for strengthening the veil, and personal reflections on the burden of guardianship. These journals link the past with the present, offering wisdom and warnings, a legacy of the ongoing battle against the darkness. As they delved into the writings, Tom and Sarah pieced together the history of the guardianship, learning about the cycles of power, the rise and fall of threats, and the continuous vigilance required to maintain the balance. The journals spoke of allies and enemies, of sacrifices made and battles fought on the very ground they now stood. Their research was interrupted by a subtle change in the air, a prickling sense of being watched. Turning to the door, they saw a figure standing outside, silhouetted against the morning light. The figure stepped forward, revealing itself as another guardian, one of the many who had stood watch during the celestial event. This guardian, named Marcus, had come to share his knowledge and to propose an alliance. He spoke of a network of guardians, each responsible for a stone circle, each experiencing the thinning of the veil and the increasing boldness of the dark entities. Marcus suggested that the time had come for the guardians to unite more formally, to share their knowledge and strength, to prepare for the inevitable challenges ahead. Together, they discussed the formation of a council of guardians, a concept hinted at in the journals but never fully realized. This council would serve as a global assembly, a collective of knowledge and power to face the dark forces that sought to breach the world. Marcus shared tales of his own experiences, of the signs and omens that had led him to the last stop gas and go, of the guidance he had received from the land and the stones. His story added another layer to the complex tapestry of the guardianship, his life another thread woven into the shared destiny of those who stood against the darkness. As they talked, the sun climbed higher, illuminating the gas station and the surrounding land, casting everything in a clear, honest light. The place was no longer just a backdrop to their ordeal but a beacon, a signpost on the path they would walk as guardians. Their meeting with Marcus marked the beginning of a new chapter in their journey, one that would take them beyond the isolated incidents of supernatural breaches to a coordinated defense of the world. The idea of a council provided a new hope, a way to combat the growing threats with unity and shared purpose. Tom, Sarah, and Marcus stood together at the gas station, the site of their fateful encounter with the otherworldly, now the foundation for their united stand against the encroaching darkness. Their alliance was the first step towards building a network of guardians, each a keeper of the light, each a defender of the veil. As they set out to contact the other guardians, the last stop gas and go remained a sentinel on the lonely highway a reminder of the night when the fate of the world hung in balance and the dawn of the Guardian's Council began to break. The road ahead was fraught with unknowns, but armed with the knowledge of the past and the solidarity of their newfound alliance, they faced the future, ready to defend the delicate boundary between light and darkness, their story an ever-evolving saga of courage and vigilance in the face of the eternal night. With the formation of their nascent council, Tom, Sarah, and Marcus initiated a global effort to locate and unite the Guardians. Utilizing the journals and maps found in the gas station, they traced ley lines and identified potential stone circle sites, each a node in the intricate web of ancient power that crisscrossed the planet. Their journey led them to desolate moors, hidden valleys, and forgotten forests, where stone circles lay dormant, awaiting the touch of their Guardians to awaken. At each site, they encountered guardians, some aware of their legacy and others newly awakened to their roles, each with stories of strange occurrences and shadowy threats that had intensified since the celestial event. The guardians shared tales of their encounters with the entities that lurked at the edges of reality, beings of shadow and nightmare that had tested the strength of the barriers. 
These stories painted a picture of a world under siege, a tapestry of light and dark stitched together by the thin threads of the Guardian's vigilance. In an ancient library in Europe, the Council discovered a collection of arcane texts that spoke of the first Guardians, beings of immense power who had established the stone circles and cast the original wards to protect the world from the darkness beyond. These texts hinted at artifacts of power, tools that could enhance the Guardian's abilities and strengthen the barriers between worlds. Driven by this new knowledge, the Council embarked on a quest to find these artifacts, delving into hidden crypts, exploring lost temples, and deciphering cryptic puzzles left by the first Guardians. Each artifact they uncovered brought new depth to their understanding of the Guardianship and the cosmic battle they were engaged in. Meanwhile, the shadows grew bolder, their assaults on the veil more frequent and fierce. Reports from guardians around the world spoke of increasing sightings of dark entities, of nights filled with unnatural horrors, and of the veil's fabric wearing thin, its threads fraying under the relentless assault of the darkness. In a hidden grove in Asia, the council found the Heartstone, an artifact pulsating with primal energy, its core a swirling mass of light and shadow. The Heartstone was a key to amplifying the power of the stone circles, capable of reinforcing the Veil to an extent not seen since the days of the First Guardians. As they activated the Heartstone within the central stone circle, its energy surged along the ley lines, linking the circles in a dazzling network of power. The sky lit up with the rural colors, a visible manifestation of the strengthened barriers, a sign of hope and a testament to the Guardians' unity and strength. But the darkness was cunning and relentless. Even as the barriers were reinforced, the shadows probed for weaknesses, searching for a way to breach the world's defenses. The Council knew that each victory was temporary, a momentary respite in the eternal struggle between light and darkness. The Guardians, now united under the Council, stood watch at the borders of reality, guardians of the thin veil that separated the world from the abyss. They were the last line of defense against the encroaching shadows, the keepers of the light that held back the night. Tom, Sarah, and Marcus, leaders of the Council, prepared for the ongoing war, a battle not just for the present but for the future of all worlds. The saga of the Guardians was an unending tale of courage, sacrifice, and vigilance, a story written in the light of the stone circles, under the watchful gaze of the Guardians, whose vigil kept the darkness at bay. Their lives a testament to the enduring battle between the ancient light and the eternal night. In the dead of night, under a waning crescent moon, a lone, run-down gas station sat on the edge of an old, seldom-traveled highway. Surrounded by dense woods that whispered with the sounds of unseen creatures, the station's dim, flickering lights barely cut through the oppressive darkness. Its rusted sign, creaking in the wind, read a last stop gas and go. Miles from the nearest town, this place had a reputation. Locals whispered about strange occurrences and travelers who vanished without a trace after stopping for fuel. They spoke of the eerie attendant, a gaunt figure with hollow eyes, who seemed to appear out of thin air whenever a car pulled up. One stormy night, a young couple, Sarah and Tom, found themselves lost on the back roads, their GPS malfunctioning, leading them in circles. Desperate for gas and direction, they stumbled upon their last stop gas and go. Relief washed over them as they saw the flickering neon sign through the rain-smeared windshield. As Tom pumped gas, Sarah ventured inside the station's convenience store to pay and grab some snacks. The interior was grimy, the air stale and heavy. She noticed the attendant watching her from behind the counter, his gaze unblinking, a thin smile playing on his lips. Feeling uneasy, Sarah hurried with her purchase. As she paid, the attendant's gravelly voice broke the silence. Be careful out there, he murmured, the road can be treacherous at night, and not all who wander find their way back. Chilled by his words, Sarah rushed back to the car, urging Tom to leave quickly. As they drove away, the gas station faded into the rearview mirror, swallowed by the night. But the feeling of being watched lingered, crawling like spiders down their spines. The further they drove, the more disoriented they became. 
Roads twisted unexpectedly, landmarks disappeared, and the storm intensified. The trees seemed to close in around them, their branches scratching the car-like gnarled fingers. Then, the engine sputtered and died, leaving them stranded in the dark, the storm raging around them. Confused and scared, they realized the gas gauge was empty, despite just filling up. Panic set in as they tried to start the car, to no avail. As they sat in the darkness, trying to make sense of their situation, a soft tapping on the window made them jump. Outside, through the torrent of rain, a shadowy figure stood, its features obscured, save for a pair of luminous, hungry eyes staring intently at them. Frozen in fear, Sarah and Tom watched as the shadowy figure circled the car, its movements silent and predatory. The tapping grew more insistent, the sound sharp and unnerving against the howling wind and pounding rain. Tom fumbled with the car's ignition, his attempts to start the engine becoming more frantic. The figure stopped at the driver's side, its face pressing against the window, its breath fogging up the glass. The eyes, now clearly visible, burned with an unnatural intensity. Tom finally managed to turn the engine over, but instead of driving away, the car's lights flickered and died, plunging them back into darkness. In the brief illumination, they had seen the figure more clearly not a man, but something else, something wrong. Its features were twisted, its skin pale and mottled, and it wore what looked like an old, tattered uniform of the gas station. With the car mobilized, Sarah remembered her phone. She scrambled to find it, hoping to call for help, but her fingers met only empty air where her phone should have been. In a flash of memory, she realized she had left it on the counter of the gas station. Outside, the figure seemed to grow impatient, its movements becoming more erratic. It no longer tapped, but now clawed at the car, the sound of its nails scraping against the metal like the screech of a chalkboard. Tom, in a desperate bid for escape, decided they should make a run for it. Between the storm and the darkness, he reasoned, they might be able to lose the figure in the woods. Sarah, terrified but seeing no better option, agreed. They counted down and, on three, flung the car doors open. The storm assaulted them with full force, the rain blinding, the wind howling as if in triumph. They ran into the woods, not daring to look back, the sound of their pursuer's footsteps a constant echo behind them. As they plunged deeper into the forest, the trees seemed to come alive, branches reaching out, roots tripping them. The line between the natural and the supernatural blurred as whispers filled the air, voices that weren't quite human, speaking words they couldn't understand. In the chaos of their flight, Sarah and Tom became separated. Sarah, calling out for Tom, heard only the storm and the malevolent laughter of their pursuer. Alone, she stumbled upon a clearing where the moonlight pierced the canopy, revealing a decrepit old cabin, its door hanging open, inviting or perhaps daring her to enter. Inside, the cabin was shrouded in darkness, the air thick with the smell of decay. Sarah's heart pounded as she heard footsteps approaching the cabin, slow and deliberate. The figure from the gas station, or perhaps something even worse, was coming for her, its presence a palpable force pushing against the fragile sanctuary of the cabin. In the shadows of the cabin, Sarah saw shapes moving, heard the rustle of movement, felt the weight of unseen eyes upon her. The line between refuge and trap blurred, the cabin's secrets as menacing as the threat lurking outside. As the door creaked open, revealing the storm's chaotic dance, the story of Sarah, Tom, and the gas station merged into the night, a tapestry of fear and mystery, with threads leading deeper into the heart of darkness, the true nature of their tormentor and the secrets of the cabin waiting to be unveiled. In the eerie silence of the cabin, Sarah backed away from the creeping darkness that seemed to seep through the open door, her breath shallow, her heart racing. The storm outside intensified, its howling winds and lashing rain creating a cacophony that drowned out all other sounds. Yet, over the tempest's roar, the methodical steps of her pursuer grew ominously distinct, each footfall a chilling promise of impending dread. Meanwhile, Tom, lost and disoriented in the dense, storm-lashed forest, 
stumbled upon a series of strange, rune-like markings carved into the trees. They pulsed with an eerie luminescence, guiding him along a path that seemed unnaturally straight and narrow, a corridor through the chaos of the woods. The air around him thickened, charged with a palpable sense of waiting, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Back in the cabin, the shadows coalesced into forms both human and not, the remnants of souls who had once sought refuge within its walls, only to become part of its dark tapestry. They whispered in a chorus of despair, their voices melding with the storm, warning Sarah of the cabin's true nature not a haven, but a collector of tragedies, feeding on the fear and misfortune of those it ensnared. The figure from the gas station emerged from the storm and crossed the threshold into the cabin, its form more ghastly in the dim light, its eyes a void of malice. Sarah, trapped between the malevolent spirits of the cabin and the advancing horror, felt a surge of desperate courage. She searched the cabin frantically for anything to use as a weapon or a means to escape. In the forest, Tom, following the glowing runes, arrived at an ancient stone circle, its presence an anomaly in the wild chaos of the woods. The stones stood silent and imposing, their surfaces etched with the same runes that marked the trees. In the center of the circle, a shallow pit smoldered with the remnants of a fire, its embers glowing with an unnatural intensity, casting an otherworldly light that seemed to pulse in rhythm with Tom's heartbeat. The figure in the cabin advanced towards Sarah, its movement slow, deliberate, savoring the hunt. As it approached, the cabin's floorboards rotted away beneath its touch, revealing a subterranean darkness that whispered of forgotten things, secrets buried deep beneath the earth. Sarah, her back against the crumbling wall, found her hand closing around an object half buried in the detritus of the cabin. It was an old, rusted key, its purpose lost to time, but its presence in that moment felt like fate. As the figure reached for her, she thrust the key into a crack in the wall, an act of pure instinct. The insertion of the key into the wall triggered a mechanism, a rumbling beneath the cabin that shook the very foundation, startling the advancing figure and halting its progress. The cabin groaned as if in pain, the walls trembling, the shadows recoiling, as if the key had unlocked something more than a physical lock, perhaps a binding or a seal. Outside, in the stone circle, Tom felt a resonance, a vibration that coursed through the ground and into his very bones, connecting him to Sarah's plight. The runes on the stones flared brightly, casting beams of light that intersected at the pit center, coalescing into a vertical column of pulsating energy that seemed to tear at the fabric of the night itself. The two scenes, one in the cabin with Sarah and the menacing figure, the other with Tom in the ancient circle, became linked by a force unseen but deeply felt, a cosmic balance teetering on the edge of chaos, each action and decision rippling across the distance that separated them, binding their fates to the dark heart of the forest and the enigmatic history of the gas station, setting the stage for truths yet to be unearthed and horrors yet to be confronted. As the cabin shuddered under the newfound force unleashed by the key, the figure halted, its form flickering between the corporeal and the ethereal, as if the key had disturbed its very essence. Sarah, seizing the moment, pushed past the creature, escaping into the storm. Behind her, the cabin began to collapse, its long-standing hold on reality weakening, its secrets and shadows spilling out into the night like ink in water. In the stone circle, Tom watched in awe as the column of light from the pit grew stronger, illuminating the forest with an otherworldly glow. The runes on the stones pulsated faster, their rhythm sinking with the chaos unfolding at the cabin. An ethereal wind spiraled around him, whispering secrets in a language lost to time, hinting at the connection between the gas station, the cabin, and the stone circle, pieces of a puzzle steeped in ancient magic and modern tragedy. The forest around the cabin receded as if in fear, giving Sarah a clear path to run. She sprinted through the trees, driven by a primal urge to survive and reunite with Tom. The ground beneath her feet seemed to guide her, the pulsing glow from the stone circle in the distance beckoning her. Meanwhile, the figure, now confined to the collapsing realm of the cabin, let out a wail of rage and despair, its existence tied to the structure that was now disintegrating. 
As the building fell, a vortex of spectral energy erupted. The spirits trapped within the cabin released in a maelstrom of light and shadow, their forms dissolving into the night, leaving behind the echo of their torment. Sarah, her path illuminated by the strange luminescence of the stone circle, felt an inexplicable pull towards it, her fate intertwined with Tom's and the mysteries they had unearthed. The storm, once an ominous presence, now seemed to protect her, guiding her through the dark woods towards safety and revelation. Tom, standing within the stone circle, felt a surge of power as Sarah approached, their separate journeys forging a link that strengthened the ancient magic of the place. The ground trembled, and the air thronged with energy as the boundaries between the past and the present, the physical and the spiritual, began to blur. As Sarah reached the edge of the circle, the figure emerged one last time from the ruins of the cabin, its form desperate and vengeful, a dark silhouette against the chaos of the collapsing structure. It lunged towards the stone circle, its existence hanging by a thread, seeking to break the sanctuary of light and drag them back into the darkness. The moment Sarah stepped into the circle, the runes on the stones blazed with blinding light, forming a barrier that the figure could not cross. The air filled with a sound like the breaking of chains, the release of ancient bindings, as the energies of the circle reacted to their combined presence, unlocking deeper layers of power and memory. Inside this sanctified space, Tom and Sarah faced each other, their hands reaching out, touching, forming a connection that completed a circuit of mystical energy. The light column in the center of the circle erupted skyward, piercing the storm clouds, casting a beacon of light that could be seen for miles. The figure, ported and howling in defeat, was pulled back into the remnants of the cabin's vortex, the last of its energy consumed in the effort to reach the stone circle. The cabin, now fully collapsed, became a grand zero of silence and darkness, a void where once stood a monument to suffering and secrets. As the light from the stone circle reached its zenith, the area was bathed in a serene calm, the storm dissipating, the clouds parting to reveal a starlit sky. Tom and Sarah, standing in the heart of the circle, found themselves at the epicenter of ancient and modern mysteries, their journey through the night leading them to a crossroads of destiny and discovery, the secrets of the gas station, the cabin, and the stone circle intertwined in a narrative that spanned the breadth of time, waiting for the dawn to bring new revelations and challenges in the ever-unfolding saga of the last stop gas and go. As the newfound calm settled over the forest, Tom and Sarah, standing within the protective embrace of the stone circle, felt the weight of the night's terrors lift, replaced by a cautious relief. The light from the circle dimmed to a gentle glow, illuminating the ancient runes that seemed to dance across the stones, their meanings elusive yet inviting. The eerie silence that followed the storm's departure was broken by the soft, rhythmic pulsing of the earth beneath their feet, as if the land itself was breathing, resonating with the energy of the circle. The air was fresh, carrying the scent of pine and earth, a reminder of the natural world's resilience. With the immediate threat gone, their attention turned to the smoldering remains of the cabin. Among the debris, something glimmered under the light of the rising moon, catching Sarah's eye. Despite the night's horrors, curiosity drew them back towards the ruins, a silent agreement between them that their ordeal was far from over. Approaching the cabin's remains, they discovered that the glimmering object was a locket, old and tarnished, but intact. Sarah picked it up, feeling a surge of energy, a whisper of memories not her own. The locket sprang open in her hands, revealing a portrait of a woman whose features bore a striking resemblance to the eerie attendant at the gas station. Meanwhile, the forest around them, once oppressive and threatening, now seemed to watch over them with a kind of guarded neutrality. The trees, no longer menacing, whispered secrets in the wind, secrets that spoke of the land's ancient history, the gas station, and the cabin's role in a much larger, older story. Their exploration led them to the remains of a well-hidden cellar under the cabin, its entrance obscured by the wreckage. Inside, they found a cache of objects and documents that hinted at a lineage of guardianship, a family bound to protect a secret that linked the gas station, the cabin, and the stone circle in a pact of silence and sacrifice. 
The documents, fragile and time-worn, contained maps of ley lines, astrological charts, and cryptic notes about celestial events, all pointing to a convergence of powers at this very location. It seemed that every few generations, a guardian from the attendant's family performed a ritual to renew the barriers that kept the darker forces at bay. Tom and Sarah realized that the attendant was not just a figure of terror but a sentinel, caught in a cycle of duty and despair his actions at the gas station a way to gauge the threat level of those who might disrupt the balance. As they pieced together the story, the forest seemed to lean in, listening, the wind carrying the whispers of the past to their ears. They understood that the gas station served as a gateway, the cabin a keeper of secrets, and the stone circle a lock on a door that should never be opened. The locket, now worn to the touch, seemed to be a key, a part of the attendant's heritage and a piece of the puzzle. As they held it, visions of the past flashed before their eyes, showing the land through centuries, the rise and fall of generations, and the slow, steady beat of a darkness waiting at the edges of reality, held at bay by the sacrifices of the guardians. With dawn approaching, the first light filtered through the trees, casting the ruins of the cabin in a new perspective, not as a place of horror, but as a bastion against the shadows. Tom and Sarah, standing amidst the remnants of so many lives intertwined with the manor's legacy, felt the mantle of guardianship passing to them, a call to continue the vigil, to protect the world from the horrors that lurked just beyond the veil. As they prepared to leave the ruins, the forest around them alive with the sounds of mourning, the story of the last stop gas and go awaited its next chapter, with new guardians ready to face the old darkness, their lives forever entwined with the mysteries of the land, the legacy of the attendant, and the cycle of the stone circle. As the guardians' council grew in strength and number, they began to sense the depth of the darkness they were up against. The reinforced barriers held strong, yet the darkness adapted, evolving new ways to seep into the world. It became clear that this was not just a battle of strength but of wits and wills, a chess game against an ancient and malevolent intelligence. The Council's research led them to discover that the darkness was not just a horde of mindless entities but was guided by a sentient force known as the Shadow Weaver, an entity that existed between the fabric of realities, its consciousness spread across the dimensions, manipulating the threads of darkness to its will. Understanding the need for more than just defensive actions, the Council decided to take the fight to the Shadow Weaver, to find a way to weaken its influence and disrupt its control over the Dark Entities. This bold strategy required not just the artifacts and rituals of the Guardians, but also the knowledge and powers hidden in the most obscure corners of history and reality. In their quest, they journeyed to the ancient ruins of a civilization that had once faced and contained a fragment of the Shadow Weaver's essence. There, inscribed on the walls of a forgotten temple, were the stories of the Starborn, a group of celestial entities that had allied with the ancient civilization to bind the Shadow Weaver. The Council realized that to defeat the Shadow Weaver, they would need to summon an ally with the Starborn. The summoning required a convergence of celestial events, the same alignment that had initially strengthened the veil, now to be used as a gateway for the Starborn to enter their world. Preparations for the summoning were extensive, requiring the combined efforts of all the Guardians. They fortified the stone circles, gathered the artifacts, and performed preliminary rituals to align the energies of the ley lines with the celestial patterns. As the date of the celestial alignment approached, the world experienced a surge in supernatural activity. The darkness, sensing the impending summoning, unleashed its minions in a desperate attempt to disrupt the ritual. Shadows roamed the night with greater boldness, and the veil thinned dangerously, allowing glimpses of the chaos that reigned in the realms beyond. The Guardian stood firm, their resolve as strong as the barriers they protected. Across the globe, they fought back the encroaching darkness, keeping the pathways clear for the Starborn's arrival. The stone circles glowed with intense light, beacons in the night, rallying points for the Guardians as they countered the Shadow Weaver's onslaught. On the night of the alignment, the Council, joined by Guardians from around the world, gathered at the central stone circle, the Heartstone at its core pulsing with a fierce light. 
The air crackled with power as they began the summoning ritual, their voices rising in an ancient chant that pierced the veil between worlds. The sky tore open above them, revealing the vast expanse of the cosmos, stars blazing with ethereal fire. From this celestial gateway, the starborn descended, beings of light and cosmic energy, their presence a stark contrast to the creeping darkness. The Shadow Weaver, sensing the threat, rallied its forces, sending waves of dark entities to clash with the Guardians and the Starborn. A cosmic battle ensued, the Earth shaking with the force of their conflict, the sky alight with the energies of creation and destruction. Tom, Sarah, and Marcus led the Guardians in the fight, their strategies shaped by the knowledge and experiences gleaned from their journey. The Starborn, with their celestial powers, turned the tide against the Shadow Weaver's minions, pushing them back, searing the darkness with their radiant light. The battle raged, a maelstrom of light and shadow, as the fate of the world hung in balance. The Guardians and the Starborn fought not just for the present, but for the future of all realms, a battle against the encroaching night, their Sargar a beacon of hope and defiance in the face of the eternal darkness. As the battle between the Guardians and the Shadow Weaver's forces reached its zenith, the air was thick with the energy of colliding worlds. The Guardians, bolstered by the celestial might of the Starborn, pushed against the tide of darkness with all their strength and resolve. The central stone circle, pulsating with the power of the Heartstone, became the focal point of this cosmic struggle. Tom, Sarah, and Marcus, at the heart of the circle, channeled the combined energies through the Heartstone, creating a beacon of pure light that pierced the shadowy veil surrounding the Shadow Weaver. The entity, revealed in its full terrifying visage, a maelstrom of darkness and malice, roared against the assault, its form wavering under the intensity of the light. The Starborn, ancient enemies of the Shadow Weaver, descended upon the entity, their forms radiant and terrible. They bound it with chains of light, forged from the very essence of the stars, pulling it into the heart of the stone circle. The Guardians, encircling the entity, chanted the binding incantations, their voices a unified command that sealed the Shadow Weaver's fate. The struggle was immense, the air filled with the clash of light against dark, the ground quaking as if in agony under the weight of the cosmic battle. The Shadow Weaver thrashed against its bindings, a beast caught in a trap too strong to break, its howls a symphony of rage and despair. As the final words of the incantation were spoken, a silence fell over the battlefield, deep and absolute. The Heartstone flared one last time, its light consuming the Shadow Weaver, pulling it into a void where it could no longer harm the world. The chains of light evaporated, and the Starborn, their task completed, ascended back to their heavens, leaving behind a world forever changed. The aftermath was a surreal calm, the Guardian standing amid the remnants of the battle, the stone circle intact but forever marked by the conflict. The darkness had been pushed back, its influence waned, and the veil restored to a strength not seen in millennia. Tom, Sarah, and Marcus, their faces weary but alight with triumph, looked upon the dawn of a new day. The sun rose, casting golden light across a world cleansed of an ancient malice, the air fresh with the promise of peace. The Guardians, their numbers strong and united, had not only defended the world but had also defeated one of its oldest enemies. In the days that followed, the Council of Guardians worked to mend the scars of the battle and to strengthen the bonds between the nodes of power across the globe. The stone circle stood as monuments to their victory and as sentinels against any future threats from the darkness beyond. The world, oblivious to the battle that had raged in the shadows, continued on, its people unaware of the guardians who watched over them. But Tom, Sarah, Marcus, and their fellow guardians knew that vigilance was eternal. They stood ready, guardians of the thin veil, keepers of the light, their lives a testament to the enduring struggle against the dark, their saga woven into the fabric of the world's hidden history, a tale of courage, sacrifice, and the perpetual dance of light and shadow.